Some addictions, like that morning cup of coffee you can't live without, probably won't lead to major problems. Other addictions can seriously derail the ability to function, becoming difficult to quit despite negative life consequences. Some people still think of it as a moral matter or a simple issue of willpower. But in the US, the scientific consensus is that addiction is in fact a brain disease. There's a lot of controversy over what exactly that means and whether the disease label is helpful. But more detailed studies into brain function are reshaping how we understand and treat addiction. And neurologists believe their work will lead to new targeted treatments, a 21st century way to help those struggling with addiction break out of often life-threatening habits. I think really what we are understanding and we are now um, um, certainly uh, know about addiction is that it is a brain disorder. So who is it that you are and what do you do? I'm Francesca Philby and I'm a professor of cognition and neuroscience at the School of Behavioral Brain Sciences at the University of Texas at Dallas. And how is your research shaping not only treatments, but how the culture looks at addiction? Well, I think that it's um, helped clinicians understand that craving is a phenomenon in the brain and it's not just um, an anecdote that people um, report. It's in our ability to actually examine those behaviors um, neurally and what those brain regions are that are actually impacted by substances of abuse and what those mechanisms are that underlie those compulsive behaviors. What kind of tech have you been interfacing with that has helped you better understand the brain and addiction? The techniques I'm referring to mainly are neuroimaging techniques like magnetic resonance imaging or MRI that allows us to view the structure and function of the brain, um, as well as EEG, electroencephalogram, where we're able to record the electrical signals of the brain. Philby's work studies areas of the brain related to reward and motivation, with much of her current research examining cannabis and its neurological impact. How does chronic substance abuse affect the brain and future decisions or behavior? The brain is highly adaptive. Um, it's what we call neuroplasticity. Um, when you introduce these substances to the brain, our amazing brain adapts to that change in its chemical environment by trying to reach some back, some type of equilibrium back to the uh, homeostasis or back to baseline, so to speak. And so it tries to make that adjustment by maybe reducing the amount of those um, receptors that are being targeted by the substances or reducing the amount of chemicals that it produces that might be similar to those substances being introduced. And so with those, with chronic use, those changes um, become more and more long lasting, more and more dramatic. But interestingly, what the literature also has found is that those changes go away over time. So if someone um, stays abstinent for some time, some studies have shown that these changes do normalize or get back to baseline. I mean, that's really hopeful to know that addiction doesn't have to scar you for life and that you can, in fact, exactly. heal your brain. Exactly, exactly. And that's what excites me the most, is really trying to get uh, to the best way possible to support those individuals. How is it that one individual could have a drink and then never touch a drink again, and then somebody else, once they have that taste, it's something they want to keep returning to? What we are finding is that there are certainly genetic um, predispositions, genetic risk factors, just like everything else about the way we are. Um, our brains are also genetically um, coded to respond to things in one way versus another. And there's just individual variability in that based on our genetic uh, composition. Um, another reason why you uh, might um, respond differently than I would would also be just age of initiation. Um, uh, there are more vulnerable periods of time when our um, uh, neural circuitry is still developing. And so any 
um, exposure to substances at certain periods of time, like um, adolescent neurodevelopment, would leave the brain even more susceptible than if you wait until um, neurodevelopment is complete. Framing addiction as a brain disorder means that, among other things, health insurance providers must help addicts pay for treatment. But not everyone agrees with the view of addiction as a disease. Some critics debate the underlying data or the nature of brain changes in addicted people. Other researchers claim the neurological view of addiction is too dominant, choking out research into social or economic factors. Carl Hart, a psychologist and neuroscientist at Columbia University, has claimed the framework promotes social injustice and a view of all drug use as pathological even among non-addicts. I thought that studying drugs in the brain, I could figure out how to solve drug addiction by manipulating brain cells. The problem was all of these other psychosocial factors, lack of employment, lack of health care, uh, poor education, all of the same things that have always been the problem. Mark Lewis, a neuroscientist who's written about his own struggles with addiction, wrote that calling addicts diseased replaces one stigma with another, hurting their ability to recover. So if you're not doing neurobiological research, you're probably out of luck as far as funding's concerned. This debate probably won't be resolved anytime soon. But it's also not like researchers have to be solely concerned with any one approach. The addiction puzzle has a lot of pieces. There's tons of research also showing that, of course, environment plays into these things, right? So being in impoverished environments is going to increase your probability of initiating harmful patterns of drug or alcohol use. But certainly there's also a, a biological basis and that interacts with the environment. And so no matter what environment you're in, no one is entirely safe from becoming addicted if you take uh, drugs or alcohol. Cody Siciliano is an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology at the Vanderbilt Center for Addiction Research. His lab studies the neurobiology of addiction, trying to understand why some individuals are particularly vulnerable. And ultimately, our goal is to, to discover ways to intervene uh, and, and treat addiction. In most cases, when, when people uh, uh, develop these addictive disorders, you know, it's not just the drug or the alcohol stimulus that they're looking for all the time. It actually is going to affect you know, everything in their life to the point where they're no longer making good decisions. The brain is really good at, at getting more of what it wants. Um, and so when once the brakes come off of that uh, system, um, then things tend to not go so well. Are there clues in the actual brain itself when you do a scan? We actually just uh, published a paper, um, I guess two years ago now, uh, where we were able to look at um, neural activity in the prefrontal cortex during the first time subjects drank alcohol. We found uh, a, a, a specific circuit in prefrontal cortex, so these are neurons that project into an area in the brainstem called the periaqueductal gray. And we think that uh, you know, basically uh, flexibility within the circuit um, confers an ability to be flexible and, and control uh, how much alcohol you're drinking and in what situation. And what did this uh, realization mean to you as a researcher, as a scientist, somebody who's been looking at this for a long time? Uh, what did you think of this data? I, I didn't believe it at first. Um, <laughs> it just seemed uh, too crazy, but uh, we, we replicated it and, it, and it, um, uh, we're able to find it again. As researchers continue to map brain drug interactions, they hope to develop new strategies for identifying those most at risk. This could be ethically hazardous. Imagine a scenario where this kind of information is used against someone by an insurance provider or law enforcement. But in theory, it could also head off a lot of addiction-related pain and suffering. That's exactly some of the work that we're doing now with collaborators, is um, now that we have not just the um, behavioral and clinical data, but also the neuroimaging um, data, as well as genetic, uh, data, we can compile that and create some kind of profile uh, uh, risk um, score or um, and some kind of composite marker based on all of these factors that hopefully could be used as a, a, a way to quantify someone's risk and be able to intervene much earlier on. Um, there isn't anything yet, although we know what these factors are. So we can try to uh, have preventative measures, but also um, if we can understand the different subtypes of addiction within each of these disorders, we can really start to deliver personalized medication uh, to people. According to Siciliano, today's treatments may take too much of a one-size-fits-all approach. 12-step programs, drug rehabs, replacement therapy, and other existing options help a lot of people, but they may also not match with the needs of every individual. 
there's you know, many different sort of subtypes and, and, and behaviors within these disorders, right? It's not just all or nothing um, addictive or abstinent, but in many cases, uh, people are can be better served, especially in the short term, by trying to uh, restore more um, controlled patterns of, of substance use rather than shooting only for, for abstinence. And we need to figure out ways to be more flexible with how we're approaching this and let uh, let there be options and um, empirically guided evidence for what treatment um, approach should be used for what individual. Do you feel like uh, the scans of a patient's brain, someone who is fighting severe addictions, could help their medical team treat them better? Yes, I do think so in the long run. In the short term, um, the expense and time of doing that is probably not practical. The goal, I think, you know, uh, in the long term, definitely. I think if we were able to implement all of the things that we know already, even we would make you know, huge, huge advances. We're not at that point yet where we can certainly uh, pinpoint where areas uh, need to be improved. I think um, we still have a ways to go uh, to be able to look at or use neuroimaging techniques in that way, like you might with an X-ray. Um, but I look forward to that time. I think there's still a lot of resistance um, to um, implementing some of these treatments uh, as, and getting them to the uh, the most vulnerable populations um, that may not be at the top of people's list to try to take care of. Do you think that your research could help fight the stigma? If you're showing that there's something in the brain, um, biology and you know makeup that is making this individual predisposed to addictive behavior, that that can somehow bring a more compassionate and holistic approach to how we look at um, addiction. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's been one of the best, greatest benefits of the field in general. Like every 10 to, to 20 years, um, there's an epidemic of, of some addiction. Uh, and these are incredibly costly um, to society in both in terms of um, uh, monetarily and in, in human health, of course. Um, and, you know, putting the money in ahead of time uh, and, and finding ways to do this before it's a, a huge problem um, really would pay dividends. Alcohol alone, just alcohol, accounts for uh, 5% of the global disease burden, which is a massive, massive amount. Addiction is, uh, you know, an incredibly costly and devastating disorder. I, I think um, you know, people may not realize actually how much uh, that is the case.